Now, good morning. Good morning, and welcome to our worship. And we have some visitors with us this morning, so a very special welcome to them, and uh, a welcome to all to come for uh, refreshments outside the West Hall at the close of our worship. Now, notices. This, of course, is the, the last Sunday um, when we have the two services at 8 o'clock this morning and 11. Next Sunday morning, for the months of July and August, we move to one uh, morning service, and that's at 10 o'clock. So it's 10 o'clock, so I've told the 8 o'clock ones, don't be early, and I'm saying to you, don't be late. So it's 10, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock next Sunday morning. Also next uh, Sunday morning, it's a, it's, it's a special in a way, is that we're having uh, a number of the folks who are going on the bomb visit to Malawi. It's a overseas mission visit to, to Malawi. Uh, they're coming here for a service of, of dedication. Uh, and so it would be lovely to have a good congregation here to, to welcome them uh, and to send them off later in the month. Um, if any of you came through the Thorburn Hall this morning, you'll have noticed the stage. Um, that's my wife beginning to pack for going on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually just donations that have been taken out to, uh, taken out to Malawi and uh, very grateful, grateful for these. So I see that's... Uh, uh, that's next next Sunday. Um, other notices, you'll see a, a rose here on the, the communion table, and that's a rose for Fletcher Barber uh, Butterfield, uh, a new son to Tyler and, and Nikki in Colorado, and a grandson, uh, a grandson to Jim and, and Debbie Butterfield. So our congratulations, our congratulations to them. Lovely. <laughs> This isn't only the last Sunday when we have the 11 o'clock service, it's the last Sunday for a few weeks when we'll have the choir. So no choir rehearsals from next week, so I'll just take the opportunity both to thank them, uh, Katie and all the choir members, those present and not present, and also Oliver at the organ, he just disappears for the whole summer. I don't know who wrote that contract, but anyway, <laughs> Oliver's away for the whole summer. Oliver, have a great summer. I look forward to seeing you back in, in September and with the choir. And we're grateful to uh, Val, Val Prothero, who will be standing in, and a couple of others as well, um, Katie Yules, and also a pupil of Oliver's. Uh, so they'll be helping us out through July and, and August. Let us worship God. Let us sing to his praise, hymn 103. Fill your hearts with joy and gladness, hymn 103. <laughs>
There is nothing love cannot face. There is no limit to its faith, its hope, its endurance. Let us pray. O God, our Heavenly Father, the source from whom we come and the ends to whom we travel, help us to worship with reverence and sincerity. Quieten our restless minds, strengthen our uncertain faith, stir our sleeping consciences. We gather this day to offer you our worship and praise, to acknowledge you as creator and sustainer of all. We have been given our lives with our richness of opportunity and our wealth of interest, but too often we have wasted or misused time. We complain and grumble, forgetting what others endure. We can be hard on others and generous to ourselves. And at times we would rather continue to wear the blinkers of prejudice than face the light of your truth. We can be selfish and self-centered, quick to take offense, sure that we are right and that others are wrong. Before you now, we ask forgiveness as we ask also the forgiveness and the patience of those whom we have wronged and let down. Grant us, we pray, the assurance of that forgiveness that we might be freed from the faults and failings and guilt of the past. Almighty God, be with us in our daily lives in which we pray for faith, for faith in that creative love by whom the world was made, for faith in the divine purpose and actions shown to us in Christ, and for faith in his church. Lord, give us faith. We pray for those who need hope, for hope that good will triumph over evil, truth over falsehood, beauty over ugliness. For our world is scarred with the ugliness of violence and oppression. We pray for hope that we will never think ourselves too strong, not to need you or to depend on you. We pray for hope that the present trials are a birth pangs of a new and better world order. Lord, give us hope. And we pray for love, for the love which is patient and kind, for the love which delights in the truth, for the love which has no limits to its faith, its hope and its endurance. Lord, give us hope. And these prayers we offer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Right, CCY is finished for the summer, but we have some youngsters with us, so we'll come down to the front just for a short time before they, they head out to be, to be entertained. And down you come. Great, school all finished? Yes, what a shame. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think so, Alec, no? You're pleased to be on holiday. Right, there we are, right you come. Right, questions for you this morning, a couple of questions. Have you ever heard of the phrase, burning your bridges? Have you ever heard that being used? Anyone, ever heard anyone say, oh, you've burnt your bridges now? No? You ever heard that? Well, sometimes people use it now if, you know, people are, I don't know, two people are having an argument and one says something kind of really nasty to the other one. And thinks, well, that's the end of that friendship. If people say, oh, well, you've burnt your bridges by saying that. That's the, end, that's the end of that friendship or, or that relationship. But it has a much older history than that. It was sometimes used in, in, in by armies, by military time, when a company of soldiers, they would build a bridge over a river because they were going to be going to attack in another country. This happened during the, the war in Europe. So the British forces would maybe be going over into, the, into other lands. So they built a bridge and the commander once they'd all crossed over, he'd give the order, burn the bridge, right? Burn the bridge. Why did he do that? They couldn't go back. No one could go back because when they got over, they might think, it's not very great here. I think we'll just go back. Well, they couldn't, couldn't go back because the bridges had been burned. 
And the other one phrase, have you heard burning the, sh burn the ships, burning your ships? Yeah, burning your ships. Well, that was given by a man called Cortes, or so history tells us, or legend tells us, when his Spanish army invaded uh, Central America in, in Mexico. And when they arrived, he ordered all the, all the ships to be burned, right? He'd sailed all the way from, from Spain over to Mexico, and when they landed to, to occupy the land there, he said, burn the, burn the ships. Why did he do that? Same reason, he couldn't go back. He couldn't go back. So if they didn't like it, and felt, let's, let's just, this was a mistake, let's just go home again. They couldn't, they had to press on. There was, no, there was no turning back, either if the bridges had been burnt, right, or the ships had been burned. And we're going to be looking at a story today from the Bible which is about the same. It's no turning, no turning back. And one of the things Jesus said to his disciples, he said, look, if you're plowing, if you're plowing, you have to look straight ahead of you, right? You have to look straight. You can't, you can't look behind you. You have to keep straight ahead. There's no, there's no going back. And that's what we're going to be looking at in, our, uh, in some of our stories today in, in church. Jesus sort of teaching to his disciples. Because at times they wanted to go back. They wanted to go back to fishing or whatever they were doing. And his message to them was, there's no going back. There's no going back if you're going to follow me. Now we're going to sing, it's actually a couple of hymns, but each just have one verse. You're going to give them out? Come on then. Here you go. You give some of these out. It's 619 immediately followed by 620. Spirit of the living God. Stay standing for a blessing on the children. <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> Just go and have fun. On you go. <laughs> On you go. <laughs> Please be <Please>, seated. <laughs> Today's Old Testament reading comes from 2 Kings, 2 reading from verses 1 to 2 and then following on from verses 6 through 14. You can find this on page 332 of your Bibles in the pew. Page 332. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. 
Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And then reading from verses 6 to 14. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Amen. Amen. The choir will sing the anthem, Mozart's Laudati Dominum.
Today's Gospel comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 9 and at verse 51, page 70 in your New Testaments. The story of Jesus and his disciples being refused hospitality to Samaritan village, and then all that is required of would-be followers of, of Christ. St. Luke, chapter 9 and at verse 51. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. May God bless to us the reading of his holy word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. Hymn 601. Look upon us, blessed Lord, take our wandering thoughts and guide us. Hymn 601. The words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. To reflect, first of all, on this rather strange story of Elijah and Elisha, and the passing of the mantle, the Spirit of God, from the great prophet Elijah to his successor, Elisha. 
Just to go back a bit before the part that was read today, we have the story of Elisha first being called to be Elijah's successor. Elijah finds him plowing, and that's there's a kind of a obviously a New Testament reference there as well to Jesus' comment um, about the plow and, and not looking back. Well, Elisha is plowing in the field with about 19 or 20 others, and for some reason he's right at the back, which suggests he was the junior plowman because he's getting all the, the dust and everything that's, that's, that's thrown up. And Elijah calls on him to, to, to follow him, and curiously, in, in Elisha's case, he is allowed to go back and, and say farewell uh, to his family and to his friends. Um, Having said that, it is a kind of, as I said to the youngsters, a burning of the bridges uh, or a burning of the ships. Um, in Elisha's case, it's the poor oxen that get burnt. He takes the yoke from the oxen and uses it to light a fire, and then he cooks the oxen on it and has a party for all his family and friends. That really is burning your bridges and your, uh, uh, your ships, but it's not much fun for the oxen, it has to be said. So that's Elisha. Follows, he follows on. He's, there's to be no going back. And in the part of the story we heard today, he and Elijah are, are in the land of, of Israel, the land of Canaan, on the west side of the, of the Jordan. And the time has come for Elijah to be taken up. Again, a, an echo that we hear later of the story of, of Jesus as he turns his face to Jerusalem. And very symbolically, they cross. They go to, jo to Jericho, and then they cross the River Jordan. So from the land of Israel into the land of, of Jordan, the, the east bank of the, of the Jordan River. And there's a tremendous symbolism there because you have Elijah being succeeded by Elisha in exactly the same way as you had uh, Moses being succeeded by, by Joshua. And in the same place, on the eastern side of the River Jordan. And again, this curious symbolism, difficult to know what it means, but Moses, we know, died and is buried somewhere near Mount, Mount Nebo uh, in present-day in present Jordan, but his, his burial site not in, not in any way marked the great representative of the law. Elijah, the great representative of the prophets, we're told didn't die, but gets taken up in a, in a chariot of horsemen and, uh, and, and, and horses. Um, the only other person in the Old Testament is Enoch, if you know your scriptures well, who we're told didn't die, but got taken bodily into, into heaven, like, like Elijah. And Elisha, before he goes, asks that he may be given a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Again, there's a kind of a symbolism there. It would be the case that the eldest son would always receive a double, double portion of his father's estate. In this case, it's not the estate, it's the, it's the spirit of God that rests upon Elijah, which again, we're told Elisha does in time receive. And like Joshua, as they return back across the river, Elisha, like Joshua, taps the water and the waters open and, and they return back into the, into the land of Israel. But it's a, story, it's a story of succession. Just as Joshua followed Moses, then Elisha follows Elijah. A story of succession and the outworking of, of God's providence, if you like. Succession is... Succession is difficult. Succession is difficult. I remember my days at, at Melrose. Amongst other things, I was chaplain to Melrose Rugby Club, and well known for inaugurating rugby sevens, which are now played, played the world over. And I would regularly be down there on a, on a Saturday afternoon and meet with the, the players afterwards, a good number of whom went on to be Scottish internationalists, and many of whom were from Melrose itself and would appear in, in church generally for the baptism of, the, of their children. And I'd sometimes say to them, would it matter, would it matter if the church wasn't here in Melrose? And they all said, oh yes, yes, it would, it would, it would matter terribly. And I can, in a way I kind of asked the question because there was almost a complacency about the ongoing life of the, of the church there. There'd been a church, a Christian presence in, in Melrose in 635. AD, there was a Celtic monastery established on the banks of the Tweed in 635, and then some years later, the great Cistercian uh, monastery, which I have to say the, 
young Morosians who used to represent the town at the annual festival always had great difficulty remembering or pronouncing. In one be case, it became not the Cistercian Abbey, but the Nasturtium Abbey, but never mind. It was a Cistercian Abbey founded in the 12th century and became a very famous abbey. In fact, the two most important churchmen in Scotland were the abbot of Melrose Abbey and the Archbishop of, of St Andrews, who would travel every second year uh, to Rome uh, to, uh, to the Pope. So there'd been a long history of the church in Melrose, and that has a danger about it. It has a danger in resulting in people thinking, well, it's always been here, it always will be here. And what I had to say to them that the continuing life of the church was dependent on every new generation who are taking up the call to faith and the call to discipleship. And I'm sure many of us have found that difficult within our own families because the present younger generations are finding church less attractive or appealing to them. They're living good lives, they're caring, they're sensitive folk, but in some ways the, the organizational side of the church perhaps does not, does not appeal in the, in the same way. And yet, that invitation, that call to discipleship that Jesus offered to those as he traveled through uh, the land of Galilee and Samaria is as real now as it, as it was then. But requires, requires a commitment. It's not simply about being attractive, being appealing. It's about responding to the commitment of faith and discipleship, but also looking at what the church is doing. What is it, what is it within the life of the church that would encourage or attract a younger generation to, to, making, to making that commitment? And when we turn to the New Testament and the, the gospel story in St. Luke, Again, it's a pivotal verse. That verse is a pivotal verse in the Gospel of St. Luke. Up until that time, Jesus' ministry has been in and around Galilee, certainly in the north. And we're told in that verse that he turns his face towards Jerusalem, for it is time for him to be taken up. And again, there's an echo of that story with Elijah being, being taken up. But in Jesus' days, it's a question of being taken up, but taken up through, through execution, crucifixion, but ultimately, of course, his resurrection. But he turns his face to Jerusalem. And that's, to say, a, a pivotal verse in Luke's, in Luke's gospel. It's, a, it's a, 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 new, a new chapter. And the next several chapters of Luke's gospel are a sort of travel journey. Although when Luke wrote this, he clearly didn't have a map because he has, he has Jesus and the disciples going, going all over the place. Either he didn't have a map or they didn't have a map because they seem to be going around in circles part of the time. And it's impossible, impossible to create a narrative of the journey out of, out of Luke's gospel. It's, uh, it's not as consistent as that. But it certainly begins with traveling through Samaria. And messengers are sent ahead to arrange hospitality. And we're told that this particular village would not receive him and his disciples. Now, there may be a number of reasons for that. There was traditionally, going back centuries, going back centuries, great enmity between Samaritans and Jews. And there are historical reasons for that. And in that sense, it's therefore maybe surprising that we find Jesus in Samaria at all. A more natural route would have been down the, down the Jordan Valley or down the, the east bank of the Jordan Valley. So there was, there was a long-standing enmity between Jews and, and, and Samaritans. And, and so that may not have been the, the reason. They may, of course, then heard that he was heading for Jerusalem. And of course, for Samaritans, it wasn't Jerusalem and Mount Zion that was the holy place of God's presence. It was Mount Gerizim in Samaria itself. And still today, it's now the West Bank, uh, it's near Nablus, um, still at Mount Gerizim, there is a community of Samaritans. There's only about 300 left, but they still live as a distinct community, uh, intermarrying and worshiping still on, on Mount Gerizim. So for the Samaritans, any notion that Jesus was heading to Jerusalem was taking him as far as they were concerned, further away from God's presence rather than closer to it. For them, the temple in Jerusalem meant, meant little. So that may have been a reason, or it may simply have been an awareness which became the awareness of others of what lay ahead. But Jesus said, it is time to head for Jerusalem where I will be taken up. And that was something that they just didn't wish to be part of. The cost 
of that discipleship was too high. Because what's intriguing is the response of James and John. Shall we bring fire down upon them to consume them? Shall we bring fire down upon them to consume them? They were clearly unimpressed with the lack of hospitality and welcome that, that was being offered. But what was their response? Shall we bring fire down upon them to consume them? And we're told that, that Jesus rebukes them. Now, whether like Elijah, they had the powers to bring fire down upon this Samaritan village, I, I don't know. But there's something about it, is there not, which is a very natural reaction. When we get rebuffed, either at an individual or personal level, or at a level within society, and we see it, we see it nationally, there is a, almost an immediate desire for some form of revenge. I'll show them. Or in the case of James and John, we'll, we'll, we'll show them the, the consequences of, of, of treating this that way. And they say there's something very, very human about that, very worldly about that, and we see it time and time again. We see it in the affairs of the world, the, the use of power. And we see it, and have seen it at times, in the life of the church. And it's a very dangerous thing for the church to have or to wield power. The church is that it seems to me it's, it's most faithful to the ways of Christ when it's powerless rather than, rather than powerful. And here in this instance, we have James and John wanting to, to exercise divine power to, to teach others a lesson. Beware of, I think, the, the use and the abuse of power in, in relationships, in discriminating, in discriminating against others for whatever reason. The churches in Bermuda are asked to recognize this time as the 60th anniversary of the, of the theater protest. And two things about that that the abuse of power that preceded it, but the way and thing in which life in Bermuda was then changed. Because if it was first the theatres, then other institutions followed. And that was done without, without power and, and violence, but it was done peacefully. And there's always the danger in the triumphalism of, of John and James. We're right and they're wrong, and so we'll show them. Well, today is also National Pride Day. And the history of the church there has been of, a, of oppressing a, a, a minority because of, because of their orient, orientation. There is a danger in being absolutely confident in your rightness and using the power at your disposal to, to enforce that. Jesus' response? Jesus' response was to rebuke them and to move on to another village. And then he goes on to show them the cost of discipleship. Foxes have their holes in which to rest, the birds have their nests, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Sometimes the Christian journey has been recalled or reflected as being a pilgrimage. In many senses, it's more a nomadic wandering because you're never sure. You're never sure exactly where it will take you. And when you are sure, beware, you might be wrong. You might be wrong. It's a nomadic journey. But one thing is for sure in the passages that the we read from from that God, from Luke's gospel. It is not the way of power, either the use of power, but especially its abuse. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A modern hymn to a well known Scottish folk tune. Well, it's well known if you're Scottish. Five, 533. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name?
Let us offer now our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. For all your goodness and your grace, we thank you, O God, for life and health, for home and friends, for all the good provision of your providence by which we are sustained from day to day, for every joy with which you have enriched our lives, especially any such that now we remember. For all these earthly blessings, God, we thank you. But more than all of these, for this we give you praise, that through Christ Jesus, you have come to us thus to reveal your love, that in his life and death and triumph over death, you have declared your purpose for us all, to mold us to his likeness, so that we may share his life. For this, our holy calling, and high destiny, we thank you in humility and awe. We now bring to you in prayer the needs of all your people. We pray for the millions, strangers to us, but known and loved by you, who this day starve while we and others have more than we need. Let not our consciences rest at peace until the harvest of the earth is freely shared with every child of need. We pray for all who suffer through the violence of others. Root out from all people's hearts the bitterness and prejudice, the envy and hatred that make for war. Help us to stand up to oppression and discrimination. Help us to be more accepting to those who are different. We reflect with sadness at the divisions in our world, the divisions of history, the bitter legacies of history, the divisions of culture and faith, the distrust between human beings that so quickly leads to enmity and on to violence and on to war. We pray for a greater reconciliation amongst the peoples of this world as we seek to share our common humanity. We bring before you too the needs of those whose lives are shadowed at this time, remembering especially any known to us personally who need our prayers, those whose sadness finds no comfort, those whose days are marked by loneliness, those who live with a constant sense of anxiety and fear, those who in bitterness will not forget. Those awaiting treatment or recovering from treatment, any who are ill or frail, and sadly those whose sickness finds no cure. Bind up their wounds, Lord, and lift their hearts to you as now we remember them in our prayers. Pray, O God, for your church throughout the world, where it is strong, make it gentle. Where it is weak, make it strong. Where it is honored, make it humble. Where it is persecuted, may it be proud. Where it is wrong, overrule it. And where it is right, make it stand. Eternal God, whom we trust not for this world alone, we thank you for all those dear to us who through the mystery of death have passed to you. Let us not forget them nor think them far away. Make real to us the fellowship and communion we share with them in fellowship and communion with you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our offering. And during the offering, Katie will sing an aria from Handel.
Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate this, our offering, and all our offerings of time, of talents, and of money, praying that they may be symbols of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the signs of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. M644, O Jesus, I have promised to serve you to the end, M644. Now go in peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and always. Amen.